freedom in doing the same thing every day. And what's really funny is the same thing for a suit. And guys in the old days, they didn't have to think about what they were gonna wear. Their biggest decision of the day was the tie. They had the uniform. Now you gotta go, oh, which pants am I gonna wear? Which shirt's clean, you know? Again, back when guys wore suits and ties every day, life was a little bit simpler. So in a sense, is my watch, I want to kinda be a part of the freedom I have. That's why I wear one watch 95% of the time. You all have something in your wardrobe that you get kinda fired up about. And for some guys, it's sneakers. For some guys, it's sweatpants. For some guys, it's suits. For some guys, it's ties. For some guys, it's his watch. For some guys, it's his hair. And there are those guys that love their hair. So there's something about you that you're wanting to use to communicate. I'm Sid Mashburn. I work with my wife, Ann Mashburn, and we have a company where we're fortunate enough to work with about 130 people and we specialize in designing clothes and a lifestyle for a direct-to-consumer business that hopefully enhances people's lives. My grandparents had, you know, they were basically local merchants in an agriculture town, so we had the furniture store, the, the hardware store, the clothes store, and the implement store. And by the time I came around and was and kind of conscious of what was going on, it was really was just down to a clothing store. Clothes were probably the way I, I identified or sort of presented myself. Even in elementary school, I was kind of putting my outfits together. And I know that sounds strange. And part of it is, again, it's because my brother and sisters were into it. And they were kind of saying, oh, you should have this shirt, or what do you think of this? And, you know, they always got fashion magazines, so I was always kind of checking those out, which was kind of cool. Think what you, you realize later on in life, and you may know it early on, but you, you're not always sure what an impact your family's business and life is to what you ultimately do, how you're shaped, how you think, and who you ultimately become. And so the clothing business and interacting with people or, or as we like to think about connecting with and sharing with people had been you know part of our provenance for a long time probably high school is when it really i mean i knew a lot of clothes but then i was starting thinking gosh it'd be cool can you are, are there jobs like this you know as soon as i got my driver's license i was working in a men's clothing store you know i didn't get commission or anything so i didn't there was no pressure or uh need for me, nothing was pushing me to sell the product except what I liked. And I went to New York and I, I got a job immediately working in a restaurant, I was a, I was a maitre d'. But I was walking around town trying to get in the clothes business. It was a great men's store. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm looking for a job. He said, why don't you come work for me? I mean, I'd met him like 20 minutes before that. And so he hired me to be a salesman for him. It, yeah, I'd love to do that because I loved his clothes. I said, would you teach me how to design? He said, sure. He taught me how to pitch colors how to analyze fabrics. He taught me how to be a young guy in New York, and he taught me how to um, sort of start to do specs on, on clothes. I was getting vocational training and getting paid. I go to the beach with some Mississippi friends, and I, and I spot Ann, Ann spots me. She also introduced me to my first design job. Her friend was going to work for a nameless startup catalog company in New Jersey. It turned out it was J. Crew, so I became the first menswear designer at J. Crew in 1985. I, I designed this thing fairly early on called the barn jacket. And so this was kind of the new version of an old, you know, L.L. Bean sort of field jacket. And the barn jacket became ubiquitous. So that's kind of the rags to, not riches, but rags to rags plus story of, of learning how to design and make the most of it. Time was always kind of important in our life. I think this one's originally from about 1983, and I like it because it's got a real sort of practical feel to it. The weight's good. Also, I like the size of the case. Steel band, I love the black face, and I love the Arabic numerals. And so it has this sort of military vibe, and it, it does, also doesn't scream Rolex, which is nice too. I wanted something that wasn't as um, obvious to look at. 
I've, I've worn this for near about 20 years. It ma makes me feel good, and that's also what we're trying to do with clothes. It's like, how do I show up in a way that does not look to draw attention to me, but looks to be a part of where I'm going? You know, Rolex is considered one of the nicest watches in the world, so it was a little bit of achievement, but also to me is also kind of understated achievement, because in some ways I didn't really feel like I was that achieved anything, or not achieved nothing, but you know, that my life is far from over. So it was just kind of a, a marking spot in life. Another watch that I've been fortunate enough to get is sort of the little brother of Rolex. It's a Tudor. And this is, I think, from the 1960s. A silver case, nice sweep, but it does have a date on it. Love the, the color of the face and I love the Roman numerals on it. And to me, Tudor's a great brand and I loved what Tudor did years ago. The space that they were in from a price perspective was being occupied by a lot of people that were not watch brands. They were brands. The other thing is, is, is on this particular watch with the really creamy face, I put a Italian suede, and this is handmade, so you see the hand stitching on here. It all kind of works together, which is nice. So I would never really wear this in a dressy setting. Probably a little bit more the way the British kind of think of dressing smart. You know, it's neither too dressy nor too casual. Uh, it's not like country, but it's a little it's kind of city. So this kind of says that a little bit. And so putting this suede band that's got the hand stitching on it kind of takes it down a little bit too, which is nice. This next watch is one that I've had for 20 plus years and it's a Zenith, but it's an old Zenith. And so this is roughly late 1960s, 18 karat gold. The bezel on this is, is really pretty and again, very, very simple. What I like to do with this is also put it on with this regimental stripe band because then it kind of loosens it up a little bit. So you have this sort of elegance and, and basically what this is is a NATO strap where I cut off the end of it. But anyway, what's nice is, is you've got the gold with the regimental stripe. So it's a little bit the way a regimental stripe tie may look with a brass belt buckle and a striped shirt. So it's a mix of, of a little bit of high-low or uh, elegant and a little more casual. The other pieces I have are, are really mostly from my father. And one of the first things he gave me, interestingly, is a uh, stopwatch. You got sterling silver and you can see how tarnished it is. It's also the way we do all of our sterling or brass. We don't put any lacquer on it at all because we want the real spirit of it to come out. Beautiful hands. Now this is a very white dial. And what's cool is, is you know that somebody has the instruments that can open this thing up and start to work on it. So it's full of life. It's a living piece in a sense. And the last one is one, one of the ones my father gave to me and, and probably one of the more interesting, it's a ball. And ball back then was a, really a railroad watch. And this is how conductors kept time. How's that? It's pretty cool, huh? Anyway, the ball company was originally out of Cleveland, but that was, I think it was the official watch of railroads. Those numbers are there for somebody to be able to easily see them, even the uh, second hand. The other thing that's most important about this is my dad gave it to me. So that's the provenance of this watch for the most part. All these watches that I own here, there's something about the feel of them that just sort of connect with you and kind of it's it's a little um, a little more organic than you think it could be because it's a machine in a sense but it really does kind of meld nicely so as you can see it's, just, it's not a spectacular collection but it's all ones i love interesting thing about it is, is, is you don't necessarily need a watch but I also most things I like to think of them very practically so my watches at least what I'm wearing every day is waterproof and I can wear it swimming in the ocean or playing tennis or whatever it is and that's when it's handy is a place when you can't have your phone my personal Magna Carta of dressing is I'm open and accessible and hey man what you need that, that's what I'm trying to communicate. So art, science, form, function, they all run together. For me though, art and form run first because I'm inspired by creation. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon 
to receive notifications when new videos are released. Thanks for watching.